All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Justice School for Human Rights. Uh, tonight, of course, we're going to dive right into talking about the indigenous history of what will become known as South Carolina. Um, before I introduce Chris Judge, um, one of our esteemed guests this evening, I did want to turn the floor over to Becky very briefly for a short announcement. Becky, please go ahead. Hey, everybody. It's so good to see you. I wanted to invite everybody to do something we haven't done before. So whether it works or not is on you. Um, what we've been doing is introducing each segment, each class as a way to get y'all settled in and so that everybody's ready to go by the time um, Robert introduces the speakers um, that we've done what we call bumper music to, which is a video usually, um, to set up the class and let it, you know, two to three minutes to let everybody settle in. So what we're thinking of trying to do is inviting you guys to prepare two to three minute presentations. It can be um, a poem, either original or not. It can be a song that's original or not, uh, a reading from something that inspires you. And so that we can open each class with that. And we also have an opportunity at the end of class to do it. So everybody should have an opportunity to do it. And we'd really love to have each of you prepare something. Don't sweat it too much, but um, we think it's a way to kind of get to know each of you better and know what inspires you and give liven up this, this stuff and open it up for more class participation. So be thinking about that. Um, we'll send out a, a reminder email about this in the next few days. And if you respond to that, um, we can schedule you throughout the thing. Of course, you'd have to show up for the, your session a little bit early so you'd be prepared to go when we hit enter. And remember that all these things are being recorded. So it'd be an opportunity. What would be really great is if, if it works that we could take everybody's presentation and create its own standalone thing. But I'm thinking ahead and optimistically. For now, all you need to do is like, please think about doing a one to two minute presentation, get it together and um, respond to the email and we'll, we'll schedule you in. Thank you so much, Becky. That sounds fantastic. And this will be my opportunity to finally do the hip hop freestyle I've been waiting to do for years now. So uh, please don't hold me to that. I, I, I'm joking, trust me on this. All right, so with that being said, I want to go ahead and introduce um, our first guest this evening, uh, Chris Judge, uh, who has been so kind to share with us um, his expertise and information on the indigenous peoples of South Carolina. Um, to introduce Chris Judge, he is the Assistant Director of the Native American Studies Center at USC Lancaster. Um, the center maintains NativeSouthCarolina.org, which offers detailed historic and contemporary information about South Carolina's Native people. Now, from Chris Judge himself, he says that he's been studying Native Americans in South Carolina for over 35 years. Uh, and he examines this through the lens of anthropological archaeology of pre-contact cultures. He has served as the president of the Archaeological Society of South Carolina and the Council of South Carolina Professional Archaeologists. Currently, he chairs the Native American Liaison Committee of that organization and is also a member of its membership committee. Uh, he has also served several terms on the Society of American Archaeology's Public Education Committee. He's a member of the Native American Advisory Committee, South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, and a member of the Southeastern Archaeological Conference's Native American Liaison Committee. He holds BA and MA degrees in anthropology from the University of South Carolina, Columbia. So the floor is now yours, Mr. Chris Judge. Thank you, Robert. It's great to be here with everybody this evening. Uh, glad to see I know some of the organizers and glad to see that I know some of the lecturers and also very pleased that I know a couple of the students out there. So good evening to everybody. Um, I've got a good bit of territory to cover, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, take you from the ice age to the present uh, with Native Americans in what is now called South Carolina. Our story is gonna begin in the last ice age about 16,000 years ago. That's about the time that archeologists believe the first people that would come to be known as Native Americans or Indians or indigenous people uh, began to occupy what is now considered the, the state of South Carolina. 
We know about them and we write their story largely through archaeology and excavations at archaeological sites, sites. And from those sites, we interpret them largely from stone tools and uh, the distribution of those stone tools. What we have learned is that the, the people of the Paleo-Indian period from 16,000 to 10,000 years ago were highly mobile people. Uh, they were mobile because they moved where it rained. And they moved where it rained because they were hunting herd animals, mastodon, uh, woolly mammoth, who would pick up and move. And so they had to be uh, ready to do that. So we interpret these folks as highly mobile, uh, a very light toolkit. They would have built very ephemeral, light houses that are very difficult to find after uh, 16 or 10,000 years ago. But what we do know about them was they made very, very well-made spear points, the last of their kind. They would gradually deteriorate in quality after that, like so many things do in the material world today. Uh, we know they had a preference for where major rivers uh, met very large creeks. It's kind of like the uh, exits on an interstate where you know you can find a motel and a, and a takeout uh, and a drugstore because you forgot your toothbrush uh, and then move on your way. Um, and uh, we know them basically from major rivers in the state. They seem to have moved up and around major rivers following these herd animals. Uh, and that takes us up to about 10,000 years ago. Now, as you know, at 10,000 years ago, the climate warmed significantly. And when it did that, Many of as many as 25 to 30 uh, ice age animals became extinct in South Carolina yamas, camels, horses, mastodon, mammoth, giant, giant tortoises, uh, beavers, almost as big as a very small car, uh, became extinct. Uh, and it warmed up. And it's hard to believe, but there would have been no pine trees in South Carolina at this point. It was too cold, uh, very, too, much too cold to, uh, to support that kind of thing. At around 10,000 years ago, we see the adaptation to a changing environment. Going. We see people still with a very lightweight toolkit, uh, highly mobile, still not staying in one place, but a model has been developed that suggests they moved from the mountains to the sea in, any, in a given year, uh, moving to the coast in spring to take advantage of uh, plants that would arrive along our coast much earlier than in the Piedmont or mountains. Uh, foraging kind of in a two hour rate walking radius of a base camp, like you see in this image. Uh, and when it was all the resources were exploited in that two hour walk, move the base camp four hours and have another circle with the camp in the middle and, and move about, about the state from the mountains to the sea, up into the Piedmont and the mountains for fall, back to the fall line around Columbia, Camden, Augusta for, for winter, and then repeating that cycle. By about 5,000 years ago, um, we, see a, a major, we see a major shift in the material culture of Native Americans. We see a container revolution. And it's actually a container revolution for fire durable containers. They would have baskets, they would have wooden containers, skin bags, uh, woven bags out of bark and other fibers, but nothing they could stick in a fire uh, and uh, make a stew or a soup or warm up water. Uh, what they had to do prior to that was dig a hole in the ground, line it with deer skin, fill up a wa water type basket with water and drop hot rocks into the water to, to indirectly boil it. And the, right above the word archaic in this image, you see some circular donut looking things with holes in it. Those are made of soapstone. Uh, they started to use these. Prior to that, they would drop quartz rocks in the water. Those rocks would explode when the hot rock hit the cold or lukewarm water. So much so that they got grits in their grits and grind their teeth down significantly. And so they shift over to soapstone during the later cave. We also see the first really substantial structures at this time. They're, they're shaped like a D with the flat part of the D being the opening. You see a couple in the upper left-hand corner of the image. And they're dug down into the ground about 18 inches. So they're semi-subterranean structures. And if you've ever lived in a home with a cellar, uh, it's always cooler in the uh, summer and warmer in the winter down in there. And so they're, they're taking advantage of that thermal quality. We think they're starting to stay in one place maybe for a couple of seasons because we start to see the accumulation of garbage during the late decay. Up until then, there's no accumulation. And that indicates short-term occupation of these campsites uh, and then moving on to the next one after a few weeks or, 
or a month and a half, say, of, of being in one place. The other thing we see during the late archaic 5,000, 3,000 years ago is the first examples of monumental architecture being built along our coast in the form of what we call shell lanes. Uh, the one on the right there, just to give you a, 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 an idea of how big that is, it's almost as long as a football. The white you see is shell, it's from their garbage. And what they've done is they've manipulated their garbage, their landfill, if you will, into these architectural constructs. And then the upper left, you see that there's actually three features uh, like the one on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, the one, fig one on the bottom in that image there is 800 feet long, 600 feet wide and 40 feet tall. Um, this sort of indicates to us some organizational changes, some social complexity changes where someone is kind of controlling this. And by control, I mean organizing a bunch of people to come and build these things, um, engineering this, the construction of these monuments. Um, and uh, perhaps these are places where, where the people that were organized this promised a really good time and lots of food and entertainment, uh, which encouraged people to come in and to work on these things. But uh, we start to see uh, some monumental architecture during the later care. So they're basically living, they're taking advantage of lots of shellfish, both in our rivers with uh, freshwater mussels and along the coast with a variety of species, depositing the, this garbage beside their house. And over time it accumulates uh, and they use it as a, a building material for monuments. And the other thing that happens in the later archaic, and I failed to mention it, was they start to make clay pot. Uh, and once they do, it kind of signals that we're into a different period called the woodland. And obviously, they probably knew if they burned a campfire on a clay ground surface, that that clay would turn hard. Uh, but they really didn't have a good reason to make pottery vessels. They're, when you're mobile, if you're carrying around a clay pot, it's going to break. Um, and so it's, a, it's an indication to us that they're starting to use starchy seeds for food. Uh, you can't go to the store, bag a, buy a bag of rice and start munching on it in the car on the way home. Uh, and uh, and you, you guys seem to be a little older than my students, but my students think rice can cook in about a minute in the microwave, but it takes 45 minutes for brown rice to slowly simmer. And so the, the appearance of, of pottery is, is telling us about the foods that are being cooked in those vessels. We call that the woodland period people start to build substantial structures like you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, they start to live in villages, maybe year round. Uh, and they also start to garden. They're, they're not corn agricultural shit. Uh, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're uh, gardening native plants like maygrass and chenopodium and sunflower and gourds uh, that are available. Uh, and that lasts for about a thousand years. Uh, at a thousand years ago, we see a substantial change. We call it the Mississippian period. People live in permanent villages. And as you see in the bottom there, they become, uh, for their staple food, they're growing maize, beans, squash, and pumpkins, things that they can store in the fall and get them through the whole rest of the year. And as you know, when you garden, you have to protect the garden from uh, the deer and your neighbors who might come over and borrow some, right? And so we start to see villages, substantial structures made of clay, uh, and even palisade walls around the villages, uh, perhaps as a defensive measure. The other thing we see is we see earthen monuments built in the Mississippian period, uh, large platform mounds. They're, they're like a pyramid, but it's truncated at the top, so the top has a flat surface. Uh, and early explorers from Europe noted that uh, the tops of these mounds were sort of sacred spaces. The chiefs had houses up on them. Sometimes there were temples on top of the mounds. Uh, and the other uh, thing we see on top of mounds in the early reports are charnel houses, houses where the bones of uh, the deceased chiefs and important elders were, were kept uh, in wooden boxes uh, and buried at maybe 10 year cycles uh, after, after the flesh had long rotted off the bone. And so what we see from 16,000 years ago up until uh, uh, about 1492 is the gradual increases in social, political, and economic complexity 
uh, as these societies were really flourishing. Uh, one site from this period out near East St. Louis had a population that rivaled Paris and, and, and uh, London uh, in 1250 AD. Uh, and so very, very complex. Uh, I'm not saying that these were noble savages who got along and didn't fight uh, and didn't take slaves uh, and didn't uh, go on the warpath, because uh, that's something that all humans do. Uh, but they were they were becoming very, very complex and uh, were making their way without metal and a lot of other things that had been around in Europe and Asia and other places for a very long time. And that leads us to the invasion of 1492, when a guy from Italy with the same first name as me uh, with three ships uh, arrived in the Caribbean. And people, uh, my students, I have to kind of correct them. No, Columbus didn't find the United States in South Carolina. He was in the Caribbean. And, but that, that event really leads to um, a lot of oppression, genocide, and enslavement for Native people. Uh, a Spanish priest uh, in the Caribbean uh, with Columbus and others after him reported that the Christians um, attacked towns. Uh, they, they spared neither children nor the aged women, uh, stabbed and dismembered. And these were folks that did not want to be enslaved and work for the Spanish on their plantations. Um, he also reported that uh, they would string up people 13, so the 12 apostles in Christ, uh, hang them with their feet barely touching the ground and then burn. Them. Um, and of course, for his crimes, uh, a lot of people don't know this, Columbus did go back to Spain in chains, uh, but he must have had a good lawyer like Jay Bender because he got it. Um, Pretty soon, within a few decades, every available Native American in the Caribbean was either currently enslaved or dead. So much so that the Spanish had to begin to look at what we now know as South Carolina because they could not find anyone to enslave in Cuba and Haiti and Bermuda and the Bahamas. So off they went uh, in 1521 to explore, it looked good, and they came back in 1526 to 1528 uh, to uh, settle a colony either on the coast of South Carolina or the north coast of Georgia. It has not been found. That doesn't help. No. It has not been found, but it's very well documented in, in, in the history. Uh, we know that there were 600 people and a, a, a good number of them were African slaves that escaped into the interior and went to live with the Indians. And most of the people in this uh, settlement uh, within two years had perished, including the leader. But what that did was it led to further Spanish explorations into the Southeast in search of gold, uh, in, in search of glory. Uh, and as you know, the Spanish, unlike uh, uh, the Russians on the West Coast or, or the English later, um, wanted to make all their subjects, all the people that they uh, conquered, not only subjects of the crown in Spain, but also uh, baptize them and make them Christians. Uh, and so in search of gold, Hernando de Soto walked through South Carolina and uh, in, in 1542, he arrived uh, in Camden where he met with a very powerful woman who, who ruled, we think, from, Charles, from Asheville in the mountains to Charleston. It's a painting in the bottom left from Florida but the description of DeSoto meeting the lady of Kofetacheki near Camden uh, is, very, is very similar. She's carried on a litter, uh, uh, guarded by her subjects um, and with DeSoto. Another expedition would leave Santa Elena, which is on Paris Island Marine Base in Beaufort County, uh, and come up and visit some of the same towns. Uh, they built forts to uh, supply Santa Elena with corn. Uh, they were looking for gold and silver and other precious metals. Uh, and um, one of the forts we know up in Morganton, North Carolina, in the upper reaches of the Catawba River, uh, was burned. Uh, no evidence of it was found a year later, and the 22 men that were left there were Spanish soldiers and never seen again. The Spanish took a break, uh, and, and, and after that didn't look like they were very interested, as you know, Charleston was founded in, in 1670, up on the Ashley River, and then for, after 10 years in 1680, down to the peninsula, and pretty soon, a trader by the name of Henry Woodward would go and visit Kofetacheki, where the lady was, uh, 
and this is his description of it, you know, and uh, such a fruitful province uh, where the emperor arrives. It's a male leader when he goes there in 1670. And if it were cultivated, doubtlessly would prove a second paradise. So obviously the, the, the British at Charleston very quickly within months have their eyes on, uh, on much of the land that the Native Americans have. By 1675, uh, Ashley Cooper, one of the uh, Lord's proprietors would buy 12,000 acres of land uh, from, the, from the Coosa tribe along the coast. We know them as Edisto today. Uh, for a valuable parcel of cloths, hatchets, beads, and other goods and manufacturers. Henry Woodward and others would get involved in the, in the Native American trade. Uh, Europe was depleted of a lot of resources they needed, uh, including furs, uh, beaver pelts, uh, deer skins for, uh, for clothing and other things. And this would be a lucrative industry for some of the early colonial British people uh, in Charleston. They made a great deal of money in it. Unfortunately, the traders that were willing to go into the interior and visit Indian towns were unscrupulous, uneducated, a uh, lot of people who tried to take advantage of the Indians, uh, take their women, uh, rip them off in the trade. And these people had the same brain as you and I, and they knew they were getting ripped off and they didn't like it. They reported it to the colonial officials at Charleston uh, they sent a, a, an official up there to collect names of the traitors. Uh, the Indians end up executing him and two other guys. Uh, and this begins the Yemassee War of 1715 to 1717. Mostly took place in the southern part of the state, south of Charleston. But after this, the Indians uh, were kind of no longer welcome along the coast. I mean, some stayed in place in the coast. Many died. The prisoners of war from the embassy war were sent to sugar plantations in the Caribbean where they couldn't walk back home. This led to the placement of a number of trading forts in the interior at the fall line, uh, Augusta uh, on the Congaree, on Congaree Creek right here in Columbia, uh, and another one out on the Black River, or the PD River that we haven't found yet. Uh, and once those forts were established then European colonists uh, came in and invaded those lands, and the Indians get pushed further into the interior. So by 1736, this is a painting by a guy named Philip Bronrick, and we see the guy in the center has a flintlock rifle, uh, a European made blanket. The woman on the left still has the bow and arrow. The guy on the far right has uh, a European made tobacco pipe and he's wearing silk stockings. So we start to see the assimilation uh, of, the, of the trade. This shows a group of Yuchi in the lower savannah who were from Tennessee and the two people like in the bottom right sitting down are working deerskins, bringing them down to Savannah and Charleston for the trade. As those forts were established and the natives were pushed into the interior, they came to live at what became the Catawba Nation. This is the famous deerskin map of 1721 drawn by a Catawba headman. And we see all the Indian towns, the Watery, the Shiraw, the Congaree have all gone to live there trying to keep separate towns, trying to keep their uh, ethnic identity alive, their religious identity intact, their, their ethnicity, uh, but against all odds. Um, I'll let Jay talk more about that later. A significant thing that happens is the um, uh, slave code of 1740. And, and we all know that what this did for, for African-Americans, but what a lot of people don't know is that this was a significant uh, inclusion of Native Americans in the process that basically broke the culture. They weren't allowed to play music. Uh, they weren't allowed to assemble on Saturday, the day off, right? Um, if you were born of one of these enslaved people, then you were enslaved uh, forever and for all more. Uh, no drums, no horns. The Native American musical instruments were drums and flutes. So this is basically outlawing all of their music, which is a big part of their spirituality. But the slave code of 1740 said you could not teach a slave to read and write. It was illegal because that would empower them, wouldn't it? Um, if you went to a slave village before 1740, you would have seen African style houses, but after that you would see European. So they're trying to wipe out European culture, or sorry, the Native American culture as well as African culture. Now, some of the governors were, were aware that it was really important to have good relationships with the Native Americans like Governor Glenn. Uh, 
uh, who's the safety of the province was key to having good relationships with Native Americans, but uh, there wasn't much he could do because the onslaught was basically already on. Um, the Catawba Nation would be formed uh, by a treaty around 1762 uh, and then taken from them. I'll let Jay talk more about that. Now, interestingly, after the Embassy War, Native Americans fought either on the side of the colonists or with the Americans in every war since. There is an incredible to this day uh, pride in serving in the military amongst our Native American communities in South Carolina. A number of them will wear their uh, POW hats, they'll wear their purple hearts on their hats. And that to me is a really interesting phenomenon that they would want to serve a country that basically has treated them really, really roughly. Now, interestingly, for a long period of time, Native Americans were not counted in the US census as Native Americans. And that begins about 1790. Uh, they, are, they are put down as mulattoes, mestizos, black, but not Indian not Native Americans. So there's, there's a, period, a long period there uh, prior to 1900 where in many ways they become invisible to their neighbors. Uh, Brett and I have a friend, Wes White Tuckshire, and he talks about these folks lived down at the end of a long dirt road adjacent to a swamp. Only people that went down there were the census taker and the, and the, uh, and the mail carrier. And so they lived, they lived under the radar. Uh, and tried to blend in in a tri-racial South Carolina. Um, here's a quote by our US president, Andrew Jackson, uh, who obviously didn't think they were very intelligent, obviously thought they were basically a subspecies of humans. Uh, and he felt like there was no way that white folks and native people could live in harmony. And as you know, was responsible for the Trail of Tears and the removement of many Native Americans now for whatever reason, and basically probably because there weren't enough of them, uh, they were not part of the removal to Oklahoma. The Catawba stayed intact, and their numbers were very small. Uh, this is a photo from 1909, shows a Catawba woman uh, on the reservation uh, making pottery. That's a tradition that began in the late archaic around 5,000 years ago and is active to this day, we think uninterrupted. So they were able to hold on to uh, native made pottery. It's become a, a, an important part of their cultural identity amongst the Catawba. Now, um, there was a photographer for the Library of Congress that came into South Carolina in the 1930s, uh, down around Somerville and photographed some folks that uh, she, she called mixed breed and that their neighbors called them brass ankles, a very derogatory term. But if you Google this photographer and her photos in the Library of Congress today, that derogatory, that derogatory term is still associated with these folks. And so um, they lived like their poor white and black neighbors. And uh, I just love this woman's coat. I think that's just amazing. Uh, and she just has a look of defiance in her eye. Now those little kids, in, 19, in, in 1938, or the grandfathers, probably they're not, I can't connect them, but third generation would be the grandfathers of a number of the folks who are the Indian chiefs in South Carolina today. Uh, that's Randy Crummy on the left of the Santee, that's Pete Parr in the middle of the PD. And on the far right is uh, John Creel, who's, had, who's, who's a chief of the Edistow. And this was a really nice article by Christina Myers in the state newspaper. Uh, back around, I believe, Labor Day last year, 2021, uh, talking about how they're, they're, they're here, uh, they're still here, uh, but they're, they're still uh, a lot of bias and prejudice against them. Uh, Randy Crummy, who died of COVID, unfortunately, a few months ago, is quoted in this article saying, often mistreated separate learning facilities. And what a lot of people don't know is that, yeah, there are black and white schools in South Carolina, uh, but there are also Indian schools. Brett Bursey, I think, even taught in one of those. Um, and uh, 
my friend uh, Fox Ayers, who's now deceased, could tell me, he said, Chris, when the, when the buses started to pick up the black kids and take them to school, they drove right past us and left us. And so uh, they, were, they, were, they were more segregated. Of course, you know, the first compulsory education law in South Carolina is at Mitchellville. It's part of the Port Royal experiment uh, for the newly freed slaves. Uh, the, and that's right after the Civil War, but it'd be to the late 1800s till the legislators started to have schools. It would take even longer for them to fund those schools. And obviously the schools for the, uh, for the Native Americans and for African Americans were probably not nearly well as funded as the white schools. You could argue that's the same today in 2022. This is the Leland Grove School out in Dillon County in 1934. Uh, James Brayboy was the, uh, the teacher, the bus driver, the custodian. I doubt that was going on in a white school. Um, and these all closed down about 1970. Um, fast forwarding, uh, there's now a process in South Carolina and there has been since about 2006 through the Commission for Minority Affairs to recognize state tribes. Uh, I think this has a lot of problems because basically a, an African-American head of an agency, a white head of another agency, and the tribes that already have state recognition sit on a process of deciding who is Native American. Now, I am a member of the unrecognized Celtic tribe of Ireland, a white guy, and I do not have to prove my identity. But in South Carolina, if you're a Native American, you have to prove your identity uh, under these nine requirements of this law. Um, in a state where people were denied their history, where they were made invisible by the census and other things, and uh, it, it's really a travesty that such a process has to go on, but that's what goes on. Uh, these are the tribes across South Carolina that have been recognized. Um, we have one federally recognized, the tribe of Catawba that Jay will talk about here in a minute. Uh, the rest are state recognized tribes. State recognition brings you absolutely nothing. There's no social programs that come with it. Federal recognition does. There's a lot of things that federal recognition can bring to a native tribes. And as, as you may be aware, um, Tom Rice sponsored bill on the floor of US Congress for the Waccamaw and the PD in 21 to become state, federally recognized, excuse me. And Nancy Mace introduced one this year on the floor of Congress for the Edisto tribe uh, down along the coast. And we hope that that process will work. Um, there's one process through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Interior with hundreds of tribes on lists that have been there for decades. The other possibility is to go through uh, the floor of Congress and have one of your senators or representatives introduce that. Now, to show you that Andrew Jackson is not alone, a recent US president uh, called a US senator, I'm gonna say the P word, I'm not even gonna say it out loud. And the problem is, is that so many people have a stereotypic view of Native Americans. Yes, they're gonna dress up in regalia at their religious events and their powwows and other cultural events, but any other day of the week, they're driving a car that looks like yours. They're living in a house that looks like yours. And standing in the grocery line, you may not even recognize them as Native Americans because they have become invisible. And for example, we interviewed a woman in Orangeburg at the, PD at the Beaver Creek tribe a few years back, and she was 90 years old. And after about 45 minutes of an interview, we said, hey, you haven't talked about your childhood. Tell us what it was like growing up Indian. She said, honey, I didn't know I was an Indian until I was 80 years old. She had just told us that she grew up in a community that we knew then and now is all Native American. She went to one of the Indian schools. Her parents hadn't told her. They hoped that, you know, that she'd be able to survive Jim Crow and all the other things uh, as without identifying with her heritage. We need to change that. Uh, there's a group called Indigenized South Carolina that I'm involved in. Our goal is to change the curriculum in K through 12 schools because they don't learn properly about Native Americans. Native American child in a South Carolina school does not see themselves in the curriculum. And that goes all the way back to the suppression of 1492 forward for these tribes and their cultures. And basically, 
They want the same things in the justice system as was mentioned, right? They want jobs, they want peace, and they want equality. And um, I hope, I hope in my lifetime that we can kind of get to some of these things. One of many ways that we can do this, uh, the Commission for Minority Affairs has a Native American section. Um, and up at USC Lancaster, starting in 2005, um, then Dean John Catalano wanted to start a Native American Studies program there. Um, we now have five faculty. We have an artist, an archivist, an archaeologist, a folklorist, a linguist, and a historian, all studying uh, South Carolina Native American culture. Uh, we have programs. Uh, right now, we are installing an exhibit of the Sumter tribe of the Shara in one of our galleries. We are doing year-long uh, exhibits of the tribes. They come in, we turn a key, we give them exhibit cases. These are exhibits that are being told by the tribe. They're picking all the objects and they're writing the text. We help them as best we can, but they're trying to tell their own story. Um, and so uh, we've... I'm, I'm in the deep, his, deep historic past moving forward. Uh, the historians then pick up, the linguists and the, uh, and the um, folklorists are working in the contemporary societies. And the archivist is trying to capture every possible thing that we can about Native Americans, put it in a central location where Native American people can come and study their culture and where scholars want to know more about Native Americans can come and where the average citizen in South Carolina can come uh, be introduced to Native American culture. And our goal is we've got to get rid of the misconceptions. We have to get rid of the stereotypes uh, about their culture and their history and their lifers and their languages. And when we first started, we would bring all the Native chiefs in for a day and uh, have a bunch of talks and, uh, and meet with them. And consistently what they said was, please tell the true story you know, that we heard that mantra time and time again. So our goal is to try to do that. Um, we are open Tuesday through Saturdays, free of charge. We're located at 119 South Main Street in historic downtown Lancaster. And uh, I hope that some of you will get a chance to come visit us. Jay came and uh, gave us a lecture years ago. Uh, we have a monthly lunch and learn lecture series at noon, the third Friday of the month. Uh, we're doing those now both at virtually and in person uh, starting in March. Now that COVID has wound down a little bit, keep our fingers crossed that that continues to do so. Uh, and then if you go to the nativesouthcarolina.org site that uh, Robert uh, introduced when he was giving me a fine introduction at the beginning of my lecture, there's a 90 second drone tour if you wanna see what's going on. Uh, if you wanna come use our archives or volunteer in the archeology span lab, I, I do a volunteer lab from three to 6.30 every Thursday. Uh, but please come see me, call me or, or email me before you come. Uh, I'd love to give you a behind the scenes tour and, and show you what we're trying to do to change the oppression of Native American societies uh, that has just gone on for far too long. So with that, um, I feel like I've probably told you everything I've done. I'm sorry if I've talked fast. Y'all know me as a Yankee that carpet bagged down here a long time ago and never left. Uh, but I had a lot that I wanted to tell you. So uh, let me end by just saying before questions that it's just a pleasure for, to be here with you. Brent Percy, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Uh, I had the audacity to um, not return the first couple of phone calls and emails from Brent, uh, going with Nikki Finney's introduction a couple of weeks ago. And for those of you who know Brent, this will come as a surprise to you. And I'm going to put it on my tombstone. Brent Bercy called the cops on me. He had the head of our security track me down. There's some guy in Columbia trying to get a hold of you. But anyway, thank you very much, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> yep, ask Chris hard questions. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, thank you, sir. That was wonderful. I have a question, if I may. Go ahead, please. Um, in the chart of the state recognized. Uh, uh, Indian groups, I did not see, and I, I, I kind of don't like the word tribe um, for a lot of different reasons, but I did not see any mention of the Yamasee. Uh, 
And uh, I know. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. You're absolutely correct. There is no mention of the, of the Yem, sometimes pronounced Yamasee. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a group in Allendale County that we are aware of and that we have been working with. But after the Yamasee War, most Yamasee uh, left South Carolina and went back to St. Augustine, Florida. Mm -hmm. The Yamasee moved into South Carolina in 1684. Uh, they, they, they were living outside the walls of St. Augustine. They were the survivors of and the descendants uh, of the people that were impacted by the Hernando de Soto expedition of 1539 to 1543. They fall out of favor of the Spanish because the Spanish want to enslave them. So the governor of South Carolina gives them a reservation in Hilton Head Island, St. Helena Island. Uh, and um, so they're only here for about 30 years. And after the embassy war, most of them moved to Florida. But there is an active group in, um, in, in Allendale. Uh, they have been meeting with us, and we have an oral history project coming up where our folklorists will be interviewing them. Are these, uh, are these folk um, phenotypically Black? Because I've seen a lot of phenotypically Black appearing uh, Native people, and I thought they were Yamasee. Many of the MSC are phenotypically African American. They look, they look African American. Uh, as you know, the Seminole and the MSC are Native American groups and a bunch of very fortunate enslaved people that uh, were able to get the hell out of South Carolina and go to Florida and join up. And so they're they're a kind of a multiracial group in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing is is that. The history of Native Americans and, and African Americans is intertwined. Um, you know, in 1715, if you went to the coast, you'd, you'd meet a, a driver and nine slaves. Three of those slaves were Native American. So they, they were, they've been connected for a long time. Good question. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, up next, uh, Chris McLaughlin. And I do have the order of questions in the chat as well. So Chris, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, so I actually didn't actually have a question. I was just applauding the speaker. But while I'm here, uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, discrepancy between some of the readings and your presentation, uh, I just wanted to ask about it because uh, there's one of the first readings is talking about the topper site uh, unearthed in 2004 along the Savannah River site. Uh, and that, that dates things back to about 50,000 uh, years. Is that relevant, I guess, to the discussion here, or um, do you have this, anything this to is, thank, thank you for a very loaded question. I'll try Sorry. to be very brief. Um, the dates of 50,000 years ago at Topper are not widely accepted by archaeologists. Radiocarbon is dead at 40,000 years ago. A date after that could be from 10 years ago or 100,000 years ago. The Topper site has the earliest Paleo-Indian stuff at around 16,000 years ago, widely accepted by archaeologists, but mm. uh, the proof positive in those old date, dates has not been published for us to uh, vet or critique. Uh, it's by one of my former professors, Al, Al Goodyear, but uh, that is not widely accepted in South Carolina archaeology, so good point. Okay, thanks. All right, and Chris, uh, go ahead, please. When I was at Grow in the early 80s, there was a gentleman there who went by the name of Moss Man. And Brett, he was constantly typing, and I thought he was submitting papers to the Smithsonian. Was he legit? Was his real, is that, what was his real name? And does he have stuff? He was supposedly working on getting the Catawbas recognized. What's the story on him? I haven't seen him in decades. Wes White, better known as Wes, that's it. It's now Wes Tuxere. Tuxere is the Catawba word for white. He changed his name. Wes has been working since he was an anthropology student in the late 60s. He lives on the Cherokee reservation today. He was married to a Cherokee woman. She passed away last year. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen Moss Man type. If you have anything that he'd type, I'd like to see it because mostly whatever I get is handwritten. But he has, we have documents at the Native American study, my friend Chris, uh, 
Uh, they are at the South Carolina Historical Society in Charleston. They're at the College of Charleston. Uh, they're at the Lumbee Law Unit in Pembroke, North Carolina. Uh, and he, he's absolutely legit. He has done a lot of work. Um, he's not great at synthesizing his work, but he is a spot on scholar who, if you asked him a question, it'd take him a minute, but he'd say, yes, back in 1980, I studied the Shiraz. He has a really good mind, but uh, he's also written a lot of stuff and he's someone who I regularly get in touch with, but he doesn't email, you gotta call him on the phone. Chris, well, let's, see if, let's see if Jay found his voice here. Jay? Oh, you're supposed to be on your phone now. Me. Un unmute your thingy. I don't know what to tell. We've, we've been trying to a back channel here to communicate with Brother Bender. He's going to have to write things on a card and hold them up to the screen. Jay, does that say you're hooked up? Hmm. Okay, well, it says I'm, he's unmuted, but he's not. Oh no, this is it's it's one of those problems that happens to people our age. But let me let me say something about about West White slash Mossman. He he was with us at the Grove for twenty years, and and I saw him type. And there was one of the historic things of watching Mossman type literally with one finger going. I said, Mossman, you could do faster if you use two fingers. He looked at me and said, I only do it once. And so, yes, the Mossman does type. And there were some questions when he showed up early in the game because he's uh, eccentric, eccentric. That's the nicest word. And they called him Mossman because he was, he wore breastplates with moss hanging on them. And generally had no shoes on, depending, you know, you know, snow notwithstanding. And so there was some skepticism about this man being some kind of real brilliant person until we started taking calls from the, from the Smithsonian for Wesley White. And so Chris is precisely correct. He's, he's quite the scholar and a, a, an asset for South Carolina. I, th I think he's responsible for five to six tribes getting their federal recognition, none, none from South Carolina, though. <laughs> all right so uh let's go ahead and finish up this batch of questions with uh nicole and then daniel and then baba Derek. so nicole please the floor is yours thank you um and mr judge that was an excellent presentation i learned so much um, the question that I had is more of a personal question. I'm, so, I'm sorry, class, it may not benefit you all, but um, I, I was, I'm told that my, um, my grandmother was full, um, full Cherokee. Um, I knew my grandmother um, as a little girl and um, very much, and I have pictures of her and, you know, she was beautiful. And, um, and then I was also um, told that my grandfather was um, half Irish and half German. So recently I have been interested in, you know, just finding out information about, um, you know, how true this is. Of course, I know you've got the ancestries and all that stuff. What would you recommend being, you know, that I'm here in South Carolina and my grandparents were both, you know, born here and everything as far as I know here in South Carolina. What would you recommend would be my, my start in, in terms of searching out um, my ancestry? What we recommend people do is construct your family tree. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the era of the, of the internet, it's a lot easier to do than it was. Sites like Ancestry, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons have excellent databases. Um, try to figure out where people were born and where they died. You can do the find the grave thing. And most importantly is to search those surnames to see if any of those names ring a bell as Native American names. Um, that's your best guess. And then uh, if, you're, if, if you're Cherokee, then we have some Jer Cherokee documents in the, in the archives at the Native American Study Center. We don't do genealogy, but we can help people kind of uh, move in that right direction. But 
a lot of times I'll hear our archivist on the phone talking to people and he'll recommend they, they sign up for Ancestry.com and see, see where that takes them and, and continue to go back and look at those because people are adding to those all the time. I wish you luck with it. Thank you, that was very helpful, thank you. Excellent, all right, Daniel, you're up next and then Baba Derek. Thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you, Professor Judge. You alluded to someone who's near and dear to my heart, namely one Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and this is just a prelude to how antiquated my anthropological knowledge is, particularly with, let's say, Lewis Morgan and Ingalls and Claude Levi-Strauss, etc. But my question is, has any of your research indicated, let's say, from the lithic period to the archaic period, any type of artifacts, data, etc., from hunter-gatherers to a class structure? Has that been anywhere oriented in your research and so on? We think that begins with the shell rings. There's some kind of different class structure there. There are leaders and elders, but every, there's no uh, denied access to resources. Every, everyone has equal access. When we get to the Mississippian period, there is, there, we're starting to see signs of a class structure. And it's, there's three levels. There's the chiefs, sometimes male, sometimes female, and their families and associates, upper class. The middle class are artisans that, for lack of a better term, they're making the bling for the, uh, for the elite people. So they're carving shell jewelry, making beautiful pots, uh, things like that. And the lower classes are farmers, fishermen, uh, everyday people. Um, we see that, and, and I'm gonna preface this by saying that we're in an era where we do not dig Indian graves anymore. Um, my son still call me a grave robber. Um, but we don't, we do, we're, we're in a period where we don't do that anymore. But when archaeologists did dig into graves, there is very different items included in graves between the elite status people of the Mississippian period uh, and the commoners. Uh, so we see that in hundreds of shell beads, uh, uh, bracelets, necklaces, things like that, uh, copper headdresses, and, and other items that we interpret as as signs of, of status, like you would maybe see a BMW or a Rolex rock watch, or you know the gold, the, all the gold jewelry that uh, sports stars wear today. We, we we obviously see wealth in those individuals through that material culture. So that's the status that we see. Thank you. All right, and finally, Bob and Dave, go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Judge. It was excellent. I'm always interested in words and words usage. I noticed that uh, sometimes historians use the word savage in their presentation. And I, I'm always curious as to how do you get the designation savage? What it has to happen for that to be put upon a group of people is known as savage or savages. And then my second question is, did getting baptized necessarily keep them from getting killed? I'll take the first one. Um, at, in the um, early days of anthropology, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, who was a uh, blue blood attorney in New York City turned anthropologist and Sir Edward Burnett Tyler uh, in England came up with three levels of human organization. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Jay, we hear you. Don't, don't move. Don't touch anything. Pastor, th <laughs> those levels were savagery, barbarian, and civilized. And as those two very elite gentlemen, maybe that's not the right, scholars might not be the right, but these two guys were looking around the world and they looked in the desert of Africa and they said, they're living in the savagery period. And they oh, looked at the Australian in. Aborigine, they looked at Native Americans in Canada, Arctic Circle in the United States, and they didn't have metal. They didn't have writing. So they saw them stuck in a stage that Europeans had passed through. So, I hope you're not reading any recent history that uses the word savage, uh, unless it's talking about us Europeans um, who were very much the same way. Um, and remind me of your second question real quick. 
um, did getting baptized necessarily save them from being killed? It did not. And you're, talking, you're referring to my, my reference about the Spanish wanting to bring Christianity? Yes. It, it did not. There, there, was a, there was a mission on the coast of Georgia called uh, Santa Catalina de Wally, uh, right below Savannah on St. Catherine's Island. Uh, they, the, the, the Jesuit priests there missionized and baptized hundreds of Native Americans. Uh, they were treated very badly by the Spanish. Uh, and in 1597, the Indians... Uh, had an uprising and they burned that church down. And the reason I asked the question, I believe in 1670, when England, um, I, I think the British had, and, I, and the date may be wrong, so don't hold me to it, but they came up with this idea that if you are baptized as a Christian, then you had to be treated um, differently. And I know the Colon the settler colonies didn't like <laughs> that idea at all. And, and, and so that's what made me ask the question. But the Spanish more so than the British were, were, were very determined to bring Christianity to their subjects. Thank you. Well, thank you for all the great questions, Robert and Brett and everybody. Uh, pleasure to be with you tonight and so glad that uh, we're all going to get to hear from Jay Bender. Let's check and see if uh, Jay Bender has found his voice. Jay, your phone is, Jay's also plugged in on his phone now. All right, am I, un am I, un am I muted? All right. All right. If you're going to be amazed to see your mouth not moving and see. You're probably, somebody help me that knows more about this. Should he turn his video off? He needs to exit from his video. That's why we're hearing the echo. Mr. Bender, I'm going to remove you and your phone will be right. your way that you'll communicate with the class or else there's going to be this right. echo disturbing right. the class. Okay. We won't, we won't see you, but we will hear you. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. All right. Technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, Chris, it was great to hear you. I, uh, I can tell you're a Yankee in spite of all your years up near Indian land, South Carolina, you still pronounce that town Lancaster. Uh, you scratch a lint head up there and it's Lancaster. Now, Chris is a scientist. Chris is educated and he is much more polite about how the European undocumented invaders treated the population that was here in what is now North America when they arrived on these shores. I thought it was interesting in the poem, it talked about we're not Indians, we're not Native Americans, we're people. And the Catawba term is Yeiswa. They are the people of the river, the people of the Catawba River. My involvement with the Catawba Indian Nation began and began and keep get, uh, says recording has stopped. But at any rate, 1975, Don Miller, a lawyer for the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado, called around in South Carolina looking for a lawyer with civil rights litigation experience to help an Indian tribe prosecute a claim for the return of land stolen by the state of South Carolina in 1840. And Miller had gotten the name of Jean Toll and called her, and I was a new associate in Jean's firm, and she took me along to the meeting, and because this is a small damn world, Don Miller's roommate in college is a guy I had known growing up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But at any rate, we hit it off. Toll was lead local counsel for the Catawbas working in conjunction with the Native American Rights Fund. My assessment of the European treatment of the Native population is one of germ warfare, principally smallpox, and genocide. And 
I've always thought it was telling that Donald Trump had Andrew Jackson's photograph or, or portrait in the Oval Office. I consider Andrew Jackson to have been a genocidal maniac. And because of his own property interests and prejudice against the native people, he rounded up everyone he could find and walked him to Oklahoma on what's known as the Trail of Tears. But let's go back in history. And Gilbert Blue, who was the longtime chief of the Catawbas, always used to tease me when I started talking about the Catawba land claim, because I started at 1760. And in 1760, in the Treaty of Augusta, the crown, the British crown, entered into a treaty with the Catawba people to reserve to the tribe 144,000 acres of land in what is now the upper part of South Carolina. You can identify, in fact, Chris had a, a map that showed the Catawba Reservation. You can identify it on a contemporary highway map. If you look just north of Rock Hill, there are a couple of right angle turns in the boundary between North Carolina and South Carolina. And those turns are part of the 144,000 acre reserve provided to the Catawba. And what was it reserved from? The intrusion of the European settlers who no matter what treaty was entered into that would stop the Europeans from overrunning the lands of the indigenous population, they did it anyway. And that treaty of 1760 was reaffirmed in a treaty of 1763. And never mind those two successive treaties, the Europeans continued to encroach upon the Catawba Reservation. And the device used to get the land was to enter into a lease. Fast forward to the revolution, the Articles of Confederation, and the adoption of the United States Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gives to Congress absolute power to regulate commerce with Indian tribes, just like Congress has the authority to enter into treaties with foreign nations. And if you look at how Europeans had traditionally dealt with other sovereign governments at the time of colonization, they did it by treaty, hence the Treaty of 1760 and the Treaty of 1763. That's how Europeans dealt with other sovereign nations. And the history of native people in this country is of sovereign nations who dealt with the European invaders as sovereigns. We get to Congress. The, one of the first acts adopted by Congress was called the Indian Non-Intercourse Act, and it prohibited the transfer of any interest in Indian lands without the approval of Congress. Well, we get to the 1830s, and Andrew Jackson is rounding up the Cherokee, the Creek, every other tribe he can find, and moving them to Oklahoma. In 1840, the state of South Carolina, without the approval of Congress, sought to remove the Catawba people from the 144,000-acre reservation created by the treaties of 1760 and 1763 with the promise of getting them a suitable piece of property in Haywood County, North Carolina. Well, it was fraud from the beginning because Haywood County, South, Haywood County, North Carolina was where the Cherokee had been prior to their removal to Oklahoma. So there was never any possibility 
that North Carolina would accept the Catawbas as part of a relocation effort by the state of South Carolina. And I mentioned that unusual quirk in the boundary between North Carolina and South Carolina, where there are two right angle corners and a straight line right about where I-77 crosses the boundary between North Carolina and South Carolina. That's the northeastern boundary of the 144,000 acre reservation created in 1760 and 1763. And it is entirely in South Carolina, according to legend, because the governor of North Carolina, at the time the boundary between North Carolina and South Carolina was regularized, insisted that the Catawbas remain a South Carolina tribe because the then chief of the Catawba, King Hagler, whose statue is atop the city hall in Camden, South Carolina, always wanted guns, money, and blankets. And the governor of North Carolina preferred that the Catawba remain in South Carolina. And that's why that boundary has that strange appearance. And when we got ready to file suit for the return of the 144,000 acres, we had a survey done. And the surveyor came to us and he said, I've located the boundary. He had the original survey documents, which were available in the South Carolina Archives Department. He said, I have located the boundary within 25 feet. And I said, over what distance? He said, over the 15-mile side. That 144,000 acres is 15 miles on a side. So we identified on the current tax maps the people who were living within the 144,000 acres, and they were to be our defendants. Now, you ask, how is it possible that in the 1970s, you could be talking about bringing a lawsuit against people who trace their title to an act by the General Assembly of South Carolina in the 1840s? Isn't there a statute of limitations? Well, because of the Indian Non-Intercourse Act and because South Carolina is South Carolina and it decided to go along with whatever it intended to do without the approval of Congress, there was no congressional ratification of the Treaty of Nations Ford, the 1840 treaty that took the 144,000 acres from the Catawba upon the fraudulent promise of a reservation in North Carolina. The tribe, having been dispossessed in South Carolina, ultimately persuaded the state to return part of its land and the state of South Carolina being generous to minority populations as it has always been, gave the tribe 630 acres out of the 144,000 acres that had been stolen and that was the Catawba Reservation. Move forward to the American Indian Movement occupation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs headquarters in the District of Columbia area. In the middle of the night, a group of members of AIM showed up at the home of Gilbert Blue up near Leslie, South Carolina, and knocked on his door and said, we have some documents you might be interested in. And it was a footlocker full of documents that had been taken from the Bureau of Indian Affairs office during the American Indian Movement occupation. And what those documents revealed was that Consistently, investigators for Congress and for the Bureau of Indian Affairs had written to the Interior Department 
to say that the Catawba Indian Nation had a claim for land that had been taken from it without the approval of Congress. There was a congressman from South Carolina who wanted to see if he could provide some assistance to the tribe, at least that was his cover story. Robert Hemphill was his name. He was from Chester, and a portion of Chester County is in the 144,000 acres. Hemphill introduced legislation in the 1950s that purported to give tribal members title to their individual parcels of land. But it also had a provision that sought to extinguish the claim that the tribe had to the land taken by the state in 1840. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, there was a movement to terminate federal recognition of Indian tribes, to use the term of the Eisenhower administration, assimilate the tribes. And there's a terrible history of the treatment of native children going back even further than the assimilation period where children were shipped off to Indian schools, prohibited from wearing their native attire, prohibited from speaking their indigenous language and adhering to their indigenous cultures, all in an effort to mainstream or assimilate these native children. It was a miserable experience and um, probably one of the most famous persons uh, involved in that uh, was Jim Thorpe, the famous athlete. Uh, and he went to the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, even though he was a member of the Sac and Fox tribe, which was one of the tribes located to Arizona uh, during the Andrew Jackson administration. But at any rate, the Native American Rights Fund, starting in the early 1970s, started looking into historical claims that tribes had for the theft of their lands. And the tribe was approached by these lawyers and they said, well, we have some documents that might, might shed some light on our claim. We've always believed we had a claim. And the documents showed that as Congressman Hemphill was advocating to, in his view, help the tribe by letting individual members own property so they could get loans, could take out mortgages on the property to build houses. The agent who was sent down from the BIA to examine the prospect warned the BIA that this legislation would be disadvantageous to the tribe. But that was ignored by Hemp Hill, ignored by Congress, and the law was passed to transfer title from the reservation to some of the tribal members. And some land had been purchased. It ended up being about 2,000 acres that was distributed under this program to individual tribal members. So the United States Supreme Court had decided a case involving a tribe from Maine that indicated that unless there was a specific extinguishment of the tribe's land claim by Congress, by act of Congress, it survived. So a suit was prepared on behalf of the Catawbas. And in, in, this, in 1975, when we started working on this, Catawba was a nonprofit South Carolina corporation. It had no status as an Indian tribe in the eyes of the federal government, and it certainly didn't have any status 
as an Indian tribe in the eyes of the state of South Carolina, with the exception of the state statute that created the 630-acre reservation. And we identified the thousands of potential defendants, people who were on the land that had been in the 144,000 acre reservation. Now, some of, the, some of the people had a defense to the land claim because they had purchased land from tribal members who had received title by this act of Congress. The state of South Carolina and the title insurance companies who defended on behalf of persons whose title was put at risk by this claim said that the federal legislation sponsored by Hemphill was a termination act, and it terminated the federal government's trust relationship with the tribe, and as a consequence, anyone who held property in this 144,000-acre area for 10 years would be able to take title to the land by South Carolina's adverse possession law. Well, that would have meant there was really no claim at all. And Gene Toll said, you know, South Carolina has a distinctive adverse possession law. It requires 10 years of continuous, open, adverse, notorious possession by a single entity for title to pass as a matter of law by adverse possession. If you had held the title for eight years and then sold it, the next person would have to start the 10-year period all over again, and it would have started at the time this federal legislation became effective. We we filed the lawsuit. All the South Carolina judges recused themselves because they had a potential interest in the case because one of the defendants was the state of South Carolina. We did not have any realistic notion that we would win back 144,000 acres. That was uh, not likely. And in fact, one of Gilbert Blue, the chief's Principal, particip principal points of participation with the public here was to try to keep emotions at a low level by reassuring the citizens that it was not the tribe's intent to take their home from them. Of course, there were people who were opposed to the tribe and wanted to argue that the whole purpose of the litigation was to get your mother and father's house for some undeserving tribal member. Gilbert was able to keep the lid on things. The congressman at the time was John Spratt. Well, first it was Ken Holland who tried to be helpful, and then John Spratt, who was very helpful. Ironically, it was one of his ancestors who was one of the first Europeans to come in and take Catawba land, but John stepped up and worked tirelessly uh, to get the case settled. Jay, this but, is your 10 minute, your 10 minute morning for getting right. the land back. Well, I'm, I'm about to wrap it up. <laughs> we, we, we want some time for questions. I can, well, yes, and I apologize for the audio difficulties. This is the first time I've ever had trouble at a Zoom meeting with audio, but the tribe, the tribe filed the suit we went to the district court. The district court dismissed the case. We went to the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit, in a panel decision, ruled two to one in favor of the tribe, and the state of South Carolina appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in part against the tribe and remanded the case to the Fourth Circuit, and the Fourth Circuit heard it en banc, which is all the judges who weren't disqualified. And that court decision made it clear that the only those persons who could prove adverse possession by an elevated burden of proof had a defense to the tribe's claim. So that exposed 
thousands of properties to the claim of the Catawbas. And because of the prospect of these thousands of properties being exposed to a potential claim by the tribe, the state, the federal government, and the title insurance companies stepped up and settled the case in exchange for restored federal recognition of the tribe, uh, the creation of several trust funds, an education trust fund, a healthcare trust fund, and a land trust fund, and a provision to allow certain forms of bingo that the state wanted the tribe to have in an effort to drive shady bingo operators out of business. Everything has worked pretty well with the exception of bingo because the state got into the gaming business with lottery and effectively killed Catawba bingo. And when we tried to get an enhanced form of bingo, an electronic bingo casino-like structure down at Santee with the approval of all of the local legislative delegation and everybody in the South Carolina House and Senate delegation in Washington were in favor of it, but Mark Sanford was the governor and he opposed it on moral grounds. Now, if you want to drink a beer with me, I'll be happy to tell you what I think about Mark Sanford and morality. But at any rate, that effort was killed and only recently has the tribe been able to get the right to have a casino on land in North Carolina. That could have been in South Carolina and provided an economic benefit where I-95 and I-26 intersect. Why is it that the tribe could bring a lawsuit in 1978 for the theft of land in 1840? Federally recognized tribes, which Catawba was, had their land held in trust by the federal government and the statute of limitations, which is what adverse possession deals with, does not run against the sovereign. So there was no statute of limitations until after Hemphill's legislation became effective. But it was a long slog to get from the tribe being essentially ignored by the government when it wasn't being the victim of the government to restoring its status and getting programs for the tribe, including housing and health care. The one question that Chris dealt with was tribal membership. Tribes are very jealous of their right to determine membership and one of the difficulties we had in negotiating the settlement with the state of South Carolina was that Governor Carol Campbell's representative wanted to dictate to the tribe who could be a tribal member. And tribes across the country have been burned by that. Out in Oklahoma, when oil was discovered, Indian agents would very often put their relatives on tribal roles so they could share in oil royalties. And this is not a new problem. It's one that the Ulysses Grant administration dealt with after the Civil War. But the relationship between governments and tribes has always been one of racism, exploitation, and genocide. If you were white, and you went to high school in the United States, you read with pride the concept of manifest destiny. We were going to control the whole continent. That policy was built on genocide, the killing of the native populations who were in areas that the white invaders wanted. Mm. And racism continues to affect the relationship between tribes and the government. If you ever have a chance to go to the Museum of Native Americans in Washington, take your sense of irony with you, because the museum 
is organized around the treaties entered into by the United States and the various tribes. And every one of the treaties featured in that museum was broken by the United States. And it reminds me of a picture that used to be on the wall in the Navy American Rights Fund office in Washington of a Plains Indian chief in his feathered headdress. And he said, the white man came and he made many promises. He only kept one. He promised to take our land and he did. So Jay, we're going to have to, we're going to have to encourage you I'm to stay, stay around for the after, after class chat. So we can take a few questions before Dr. Green. Right. There's a segue he needs to do about the, the, the European invaders here before 8.30 or thereabouts. But right. uh, I've really, Jay spent more than 20 years working on a case that was 190 years old, did not get paid by the hour. And I think we all need to give Jay a big hand. <laughs> but what a, what a great story. Jay, was, let me ask the first question. Was this the last right. great war between Native Americans and the federal government and the state government and that, that they won? Has there been anything analogous to this in terms of winning a great deal of territory? Oh, I, I think there's been a highly significant case, not in terms of territory won, but in terms of tribal sovereignty. And tribes guard their sovereignty quite jealously. The U.S. That's Supreme fine. Court ruled last year or the year before that almost the entire eastern half of Oklahoma is Indian country, and the Indian tribes and courts have jurisdiction over crimes committed in eastern Oklahoma. That's great. Robert, take, take questions from the audience, please. All right. We have time for a few so, questions. Again, please just raise your hand, and I'll try to Get to you as fast as I can. Um, so if you have any questions for Jay, please go ahead, get them to us now. Questions. Marjorie, I see your hand is raised. Jay, I'm curious. Um, am, I on, am I unmuted? No, we can hear you. Go ahead. No, I can hear you. I can, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the the outcome of the of the gambling. You said that there was something imminent in terms of their ability to engage in gambling. Uh, for the, the Catawba, the Catawba tribe has now obtained federal legislation that permits it to open a casino in North Carolina. That was opposed by the Cherokee, who would like to have the gambling monopoly in North Carolina for Indian tribes. But uh, the Catawba tribe has opened and will continue to operate uh, a casino in North Carolina. Okay. It, it should have been in South Carolina, uh, but for Marky Mark Sanford and his phony notion of morality, it, I've don't think it was morality at all. I think it was ignorance and racism, which shouldn't surprise any of you who have ever heard of him. Uh, so, but thank you, Jay. Uh, bitch, yeah, I don't like the guy. <laughs> any other questions for Jay this evening? Dr. Green, I see Nicole has her hand up. Oh, Nicole, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much um, for your presentation, Mr. Bender. Um, I, I have a question. I think I'm just not understanding something. So I always thought that um, Native American territories, um, like the any kind of reservation was sovereign land. And so I was confused by this, this um, notion that they had to pay taxes when I was reading through the 2007 decision for the um, Catawba Indian tribe uh, and, and it noted that they had to pay taxes and also they didn't have almost like they didn't have um, the right to lease their land either if they wanted to, which I thought was odd. Like why do they not have that kind of right as a sovereign uh, kind of, I guess, territory. They're, they're, 
Yeah, there, there are two questions there, and they're both excellent. Uh, the relationship between the Catawba people and the state of South Carolina was negotiated, and the Catawba Indian Land Claim Settlement Act was enacted by Congress and by the state of South Carolina, and it provides certain things, and uh, being subject to state taxation is one of the attributes of that settlement. The one of the aspects of taxation is that if you are a Catawba potter, and I don't know if y'all, I don't think you've got to see uh, the background of where I'm speaking from. I'm in a room and behind me, I have many examples of Catawba pottery and it's a tradition as Chris pointed out that's gone on for uh, thousands of years. Uh, no sales tax is collected on Catawba pottery sold by Catawba potters or other Catawba crafts like gourds and things like that or drums. Uh, so it's the sovereign relationship between the state of South Carolina and the Catawba nation was negotiated as part of the land claim settlement. But sovereign sovereignty among tribes is very serious, particularly in the larger Western tribes. I just got back from New Mexico and my house in New Mexico is located uh, adjacent to a Pueblo. And the Pueblo has a roadblock that you have to pass through to get on the reservation because of COVID. And if you don't have a pass, to go through there or you're not a tribal member, you have to be screened. Uh, can you imagine if some city in South Carolina decided to exercise its sovereignty to say you can't come into West Columbia unless you've been screened or unless you live here? And, you know, the yahoos in South Carolina would have said, hell no, I want to be infected. But because of the sovereign ability of the Pueblos, in fact, all the Pueblos I know of in New Mexico, uh, limit access because of COVID. Uh, you don't, they're, they're not in, in New Mexico, for example, the tribes are not subject to uh, state taxes on cigarettes, so they have smoke shops. Uh, they're not subject to state gasoline taxes, so typically they have gas stations that sell gasoline less expensively than non-tribal gas stations. It's it's not a lot, but it's, you know, several cents a gallon, whatever the state taxes on gasoline. The tribes have courts. They can prosecute crimes on their reservations. Up in Alaska, where there are tribal villages and alcoholism is a serious problem. The native people not only have prohibited the sale of alcohol in some of their villages, they have prohibited the possession of alcohol even by non-natives in those villages. And they have the authority to do that under their sovereignty. A couple more so there, minutes. There are, varying degrees, there are varying degrees of sovereignty. Couple more minutes, Jay. We, we've got uh, Greg has a question. Robert, you want to? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, Greg's question to Jay is: Can Jay recommend any great books on his fight on behalf of the Catawba tribe? There's a book called "The People of the River," and the author escapes me. It is a very honest appraisal of the relationship between the Catawba people and the Europeans. And, but in terms of a book describing the litigation, no, there isn't one that I know of. Okay, it looks like that book is, people that were by Douglas Summers Brown, Chris Judge, put that in the chat, uh, um, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, an academic, he would know that. I just couldn't remember. 
All right. Any one final question? Anybody else have a question they want to ask before we move on? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So, um, with that being said, uh, I'm going to do a a speed run through uh, European colonization. Um, so, Daniel, if you don't mind, could you give me sharing screen privileges just for a few minutes? Um, a lot of what I'm about to talk about, um, some of this has been covered by Chris Judge already, uh, especially in terms of the uh, early Spanish exploration of the area and all of that. So I'm going to actually focus a bit more on what the English are doing in Carolina. Um, and so let me go back a little bit. So one thing you have to remember about uh, this period of European and world history is that by the 1660s, of course, uh, England is in competition with Spain, with France, with Portugal um, over control of various lands in the New World. By the 1660s, of course, uh, Spain and Portugal have a, a deep, deep colonization effort underway in South America, in the Caribbean, Mexico, uh, and you're seeing them especially the Spanish, slowly begin to move into North America. At the same time, of course, as many of you already know, the English already have colonies in places like Massachusetts and Virginia uh, going to the 1660s. But what's also important to note, and we'll get into more detail about this next week, is that the English have already also taken possession of islands such as Bermuda and Barbados and the Atlantic Ocean, which have become incredibly profitable because of their use of enslaved African labor. Now, the map you see before you right now is actually uh, an artist rendering of the land that was initially ceded actually all the way back in 1629 by Charles I. Um, there was an initial idea of colonizing part of North America and it was referred to as Carolina, you know, in honor of Charles I. Um, however, the actual effort to colonize Carolina colony didn't really get underway until much, much later in the 17th century, by the 1660s. This is the point at which you begin to see colonization efforts in and around what will now be known as Charlestown, or Charleston, South Carolina, by 1670. Now, a good chunk of this colonization is taking place because um, settlers in Bermuda, in Barbados, who again have profited from the slave trade, quite simply, they need additional land and they're looking West North America for that land. Now, with the initial colony around Charlestown in 1669 and 1670, you do see a good chunk of settlers from Barbados and Bermuda going to settle Charlestown. And again, you want to keep in mind that what makes Carolina colony unique amongst all the English colonies is that it's the only one um, that is founded essentially for the express purpose of perpetuating slavery. Uh, in this case, the enslavement of Africans. And, I, and I'm glad that Chris also mentioned the enslavement of indigenous peoples as well, because we, we often separate those two issues of slavery, but they're actually very tightly interconnected. You're seeing that with the history of South Carolina as well. Now, one thing that makes Carolina really interesting as well is that it has some direct links to the very ideas of, of what we now consider as, as liberalism in the West. So, for example, John Locke, who is best known for writing the two treatises of government in the 1680s, he's one of the writers of the original Carolina Constitution in the 1660s. Now, you don't want to read too much into this because for Locke at the time, writing that constitution was more of just a job he had to do. It was a way to say, these are the actual rules of Carolina Colony, so on and so forth, and just move on from there. But I still think it is a rather interesting irony that John Locke, a man who was associated with some of the ideas of liberalism, individual liberties, ideas that are incredibly important, Declaration of Independence, for example, is also, in essence, present at the creation of South Carolina as well, through his writing of the Constitution. But we can't really talk about South Carolina without talking about slavery. And 
As I mentioned before, the settlers from Newton Barbados, they're colonizing Carolina because they want to perpetuate slavery in the mainland. What's also important to note is that Charles II, who was king of England during this time period, was king from 1660 until 1685, Charles II is also deeply invested in the slave trade. And so he is very aggressive at trying to find new territories to not only expand English power and authority, but also new territories where he can expand the slave trade. And of course, Carolina is part of that. Now on the left-hand side is an artist's rendering of Englishmen capturing um, indigenous peoples. And on the right, of course, you see an advertisement uh, from around Charlestown um, about enslaved Africans. Now we're gonna discuss enslaved Africans in more detail in a couple of class sessions, but I do wanna make very quick notice of something in this advertisement. If you look closely at it, it does mention that these are Negroes who are from the uh, Windward and Rice Coast. It's mentioning specifically where they are from. And this is incredibly important to understanding how the enslavement of Africans worked. Um, for far too often, historians have said that enslaved Africans were used for manual labor. They were used for unskilled labor. That's absolutely not true, it's nonsense. Uh, the enslaved Africans who were captured in the Americas were valued and prized precisely because they were skilled laborers. They understood a variety of engineering technologies and agricultural technologies that were incredibly important to really creating the backbone of commerce and economics in the Americas in the 17th and 18th centuries. And they're mentioning, hey, these folks are from the Rice Coast. I wonder why that would matter in South Carolina, right? Because of things like rice plantations, one of the early cash crops of the low country. Um, they're bringing in Africans from West Africa who were incredibly skilled in growing rice and growing certain other crops as well. We haven't yet gotten to the point where they're growing a lot of cotton in the Carolinas that will come much later, but what you're seeing already from the get-go is that things like rice, indigo production, et cetera, is going to be a key economic cog in the growth and development of Carolina color. Now, during this first 75 years or so, from the 1660s until the middle of the 18th century, it's important to note that most of the settlers, the European settlers living in Carolina colony are living fairly close close to the coastline. Um, they are going to slowly start creeping further inland as Chris Judge alluded to in his presentation, but that's going to take some time. It's gonna take some effort before they do that. And again, a lot of that is actually linked to the growth of slavery. One thing that's gonna push a lot of white Europeans further inland is competition with large plantations in the low country. They simply cannot compete with that use of, massive use of slave labor and so some white Europeans begin to move further into what we call the Midlands and the upstate by the middle of the 18th century. Again, a lot of this is linked to race and slavery and economic competition. Again, also indigo is one of the, the great crops in this time period. Uh, if you really wanted to show yourself as, as a true person of, of, of high culture and high fashion, you try to get your hands on something that had indigo in it, very expensive dye to process and use for clothing. Now this map I always show the students because I think it puts in the context just why Carolina colony was so important. And you look at the map it not only includes the colonies but also includes the indigenous tribes that were in those areas too. Now for the sake of Carolina colony, I want you to turn your attention in particular to what's to its south. Uh, specifically Florida. The Spanish colony had been there since around 1513. By the time Carolina colony is formed in the 1660s, excuse me, there is a serious competition underway between England and Spain, in Europe, in the Atlantic, in the Americas. And Carolina colony is really on the front lines of this competition in North America, so much so that as soon as the colony is formed, um, English leaders back in England are very concerned about security of the colony, of protecting it from the Spanish on the one hand as an external threat and from enslaved Africans as an internal threat. And of course, you also add to that 
uh, the Yamasee tribe as well, the devastating Yamasee war was of the colony too. And of course we discussed the Yamasee war a moment ago. I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but it is worth noting the Yamasee war is one of the bloodiest wars in American colonial history. Um, in terms of the sheer population size and the sheer scale of, of deaths, it was an incredibly bloody war. It nearly destroyed the Carolina colony as a whole. Um, and in many ways, you could argue that the fate of South Carolina was changed by the European victory in the Yamasee War. Okay, this is the map that Chris Judd showed a moment ago. But I want to turn my attention just for a moment to my home state of Georgia, which was founded as a colony around 1732-33. Now, the map I have here, if you look at it very closely, this is a map from around that time period. And as you can see, um, it Georgia's in very small letters right here, but the map really does showcase how Europeans kind of thought of this part of America, where you have North Carolina up here, you have South Carolina here, and then you have Florida right here. And, and Georgia's founding, was primarily a matter of security. There was a feeling that for the English and for those of South Carolina, they really wanted something as a buffer zone between South Carolina and Florida. And so the Georgia colony was founded partly as a buffer zone. Uh, ironically, when it was initially founded in 1733, it was actually meant to be a colony free of enslaved people, but very quickly that went by the wayside. However, for folks living in South Carolina, they're always keeping one eye on Spanish Florida and another eye on the enslaved Africans among them. And these two forces are actually linked together. By the 1730s, the Spanish had announced and had allowed to leak through the grapevine of, of trade, trading networks across North America, that if you were an enslaved African, and let's say you were able to make it to Spanish territory, and you pledged your fealty and loyalty to the Spanish crown, then you'd be guaranteed your freedom after that. Now, this was a deal that the English, not surprisingly, did not really tell their enslaved Africans about. They didn't exactly spread the word about it. But enslaved Africans in South Carolina were able to learn about this idea that if they fled to the Spanish lines, they may be able to get their freedom in the process. Now, this leads, of course, many historians argue, to the Stoner Rebellion of 1739. This is the actual marker that talks about the Stoner Rebellion or Stoner Insurrection. It began on September 9th, 1739. Now, one of the big things about this rebellion that I really want to point out here is that we always want to keep in mind that enslaved Africans, like their European counterparts, were well aware they lived in a world that was much larger than just the plantation they lived on or the town that they inhabited. That they were aware they were part of a much larger Atlantic world that included rivalries amongst the great European powers, that included commerce with different parts of the Atlantic world, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. But the enslaved Africans were also aware of the idea that the European powers, in an attempt to defeat each other, were often using the enslaved as pawns in their much larger imperial game. For the Africans involved in the Stoner Rebellion, some of whom were, we believe, uh, from the Congo Kingdom and had military and wartime experience as soldiers and as warriors, for them, we're pretty sure that their main goal was to make it towards Spanish Florida. Uh, on September 9th, when the rebellion begins, uh, they kill two shopkeepers, they kill a few slave owners, but their main goal is not so much to stay and fight as it is to go south towards Spanish Florida. And their goal was to make it Spanish Florida as fast as they could. And what's interesting is that the enslaved Africans almost make it. Uh, they are ultimately stopped by a larger militia force in South Carolina, and many of them are actually executed. Now, I know we'll get a lot more detail about this in the next couple of class sessions when we talk about rebellions and the enslaved and how the enslaved resist being enslaved in South Carolina. But I think with the Stoner Rebellion, this is actually a really good place for us to think about 
how this European entry into North America forces South Carolina to very quickly take on draconian laws, to take on the, this identity as a security state. Um, you look at this image, it's actually an artist's rendering of what the enslaved may have looked like if they tried to march uh, valiantly towards Spanish held Florida. But one of the results of the Stoner Rebellion is what's called the Negro Act of 1740. Now, this act is going to stay basically on the books until the end of the American Civil War in 1865. So it survives colonization, it survives the Revolutionary War, it survives the antebellum period, it goes all the way to the end of the Civil War. And essentially what it does is it, pro it prohibits the teaching of enslaved Africans how to read or write, and it also prevents them from assembling in groups, it prevents them from, from raising food or money. These are, of course, all different ways, different methods by which the leadership of South Carolina tried to make sure that Africans were kept in their place, that place, of course, being slavery. But what you see here is how the state of South Carolina, as we've seen this evening, is shaped by one main force, and it's the force of brute European colonization. And it manifests itself in two ways. Of course, with the expulsion of indigenous peoples from the land here and the introduction of enslaved Africans to the land. Now, as we've seen with the Stoner Rebellion, with the Yamasee War, and as we'll see in the weeks to come with other acts of rebellion against the authorities, South Carolina has never been a place of ironclad security for white supremacy. Instead, it has been a battleground in many ways about ideas of liberty and freedom and how, as we saw with John Locke, how those ideals may look to the eyes of Europeans versus how they may look to those in the Yamasee tribe, the Talba nation, or those of African descent. So I've got about uh, three minutes. And again, that was the, the speed run version of, of the English impact on South, South Carolina. Any questions at all in the time that we have left? Well, Robert, I have a question. The, the, yes. the, the line I saw on that earlier map that uh, demarcated the Florida area right. was right below the Savannah River. Yeah, so, that, so that's, that's one of the great things about, uh, say great sarcastically, one of the great things about um, cartographers trying to make these maps in the 17th century where, and I actually, I'll go back to that map right now because one of the things that um, is also quite clear is that if you look at the map just for a quick second, not only is the map going to Florida right here, the 29th parallel, it also goes from what's called sea to sea. So technically, <laughs> South Carolina will, will, will spread all the way to the Pacific Ocean at a certain point um that would have made i-26 even worse than it is now but i digress um what is important though is that what happens over time is that gradually they they re demarcate these lines again so this initial line i want to say is from the 1629 version of carolina calling they they had initially a portion and the line you see here 36 and 31 parallels is from the 1660s so it's probably not practical for Jay Bender to sue to get for us to get control of California. I, you know, I mean, it's it's an idea. It, it's an idea. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, I see Greg had a question in the chat, and I thought Baba Derby have your hand up as well. So let me answer Greg's question first. Uh, Dr. Green, you said Negro Act prohibited slaves from learning how to write. That include learning to read. Uh, yes, it did. That included. Prohibitions learning how to both read and write. Um, Bob Adair, go ahead with your question, please, sir. Uh, uh, thank you for your um, presentation, Dr. Green. Um, the John Locke, uh, I wanted to go back to Locke for a second. Was not John Locke instrumental in the idea of private property land ownership <laughs> as a, another form, saying that if You've never worked, I call it um, the law of non-use. 
if you're not using it, I have a right to take it and use it for myself. <laughs> but John, was he not one of the instrumental people in the idea of private property? Right. Yeah, you know, he, he certainly was. And I think what's important about Locke is that he's one of those individuals in the late 17th century who's helping to develop both the political, well, the political, the economic, and philosophical basis for modern capitalism, uh, modern ideas of Western liberalism, politically speaking. And so certainly that idea of private property is one that, that he pushes forward. In fact, you think about things like the question of dependence, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Before that, it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, that kind of thing. So yeah, Locke is certainly really important in that regard. Um, which is why I brought him up this evening, because I, I do think it's interesting that he's part of the very founding of South Carolina for his right to the Constitution. And quickly, my second question has to do, is there a relationship between the Stono Rebellion and the building of the Citadel? Um, oh, that's a good question. So I, if memory serves, not with the Stono Rebellion, but later on, uh, we'll get to this in a couple of weeks or so. You will see the right connection between the Citadel and another, some say, attempt at revolt near Charleston. We'll get to that in about a week or so. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. I saw a question in the chat. Oh, from Don Murphy. This is this is a this is a big one. The global European colonization effort was it successful due to superior weaponry and strategy? Well. Now that's an interesting question that we could spend all night discussing, but I to to make a long story short, um, to answer your question to an extent, yes, it, it does have to do with having uh, superior weaponry to an extent, superior technology, but you do also want to consider the fact that. Part of what's driving Western Europe, especially England, Spain, France, Portugal, to an extent, is, and Chris alluded to this earlier, is this insatiable appetite for resources. Um, I often ask my students, when we're thinking about this early history of colonization, we often focus understandably on Europe. But another question to ask is, well, right around the same time, going back to the 1480s and 1490s, the kingdoms of West Africa are almost as, uh, basically as advanced as those of Europe. And the question should be, well, why didn't West African kingdoms go deep into the Atlantic and do the kind of exploration? And it's because for West Africa, they were often looking either northward towards North Africa or internally into Central Africa, thinking about trade and political relationships. Western Europe is being driven by this constant hunger for resources, this constant hunger for additional land, trying to really find new places to not only send colonists, but also find new places that could be sources for gold, for silver, for other products. Um, and again, I don't want to make this seem like it's automatic, right? Because there were setbacks the European powers suffered during this conflict, uh, greed certainly <laughs> being a big part of that Dr. Goldman put in the chat. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, to an extent, yes, it was due to those successful use of, of advanced weapons and technology and such and tactics. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it was automatic. Um, there were things that could have gone differently. Um, you think about the attempts at slave revolts in the Caribbean and Brazil during this era. Um, but the, the answer to your, your, your very interesting and important question, yes, although with some caveats here. Any other questions? Dr. Green, you want to let people know what we'll be doing next Monday? Um, well, you know, what's what's interesting is that next Monday's class is, uh, is going to pick up where we left off this evening. Um, so next week, we're going to get into the stolen history of stolen people. So it's, being led by Dr. Bernie Gallman, Dr. Allison McCletchy. Um, in essence, they're going to get much more in depth with talking about not just the history of enslaved Africans, 
but reminding all of us that these peoples had a history long before slavery, a history, a rich history, a rich tradition that we're going to learn much more about next week that begins in Africa. I'm really excited about that presentation next week. I hope to see all of you back there again. And uh, before we finish up this evening, I want to give a special hand of thanks to Chris Judge and Jay Bender for once again doing a fantastic job this evening.